Well, welcome everybody. Mike, you're sharing your screen, right? Looks good. Yeah. So Looks good. before we get into introductions, we'll let you know that um, this presentation is done in Google Slides and you can get the all the slides, uh, which has tons of hyperlinks. So you might want these slides by going to the QR code or by going to the bit.ly bit.ly slash inclusive 365 VSTE. Uh, that's bit.ly slash inclusive 365 VSTE. And someone will put it in the chat. Who's going to do it? I'm doing it right now. Let's do it as well. Um, we also want to invite you before we even introduce ourselves again, that to, to, to recognize that for the next hour, we would love for it to be more of a, of a two way street, a participation, um, more than a sit and get, if you will. So with that's sort of our expectation. We hope that's why you came here too, is to have some interaction and we'll take it from there. Awesome, and Chris said it all. Hi, everybody. That's kind of our plan is we want you to be involved. Put your mics on, put your cameras on. Hi, Denise, we see you. That's great. Love to see other people. Um, not that I don't love to see my co-authors, but I love to see other people too. Uh, feel free, um, make this hour work for you. Um, it, 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 Chris is right when he says, we, we really dislike this idea of just speaking at people. We would love to speak with you. Um, so make sure you participate and get something from the webinar. And we are very excited to be here with you today. So, okay, here's a quick introduction. So my name is Chris Bouguet and I, but the day job that I'm taking an hour off from right now is to work for Loudoun County Public Schools up here in Northern Virginia. So I'm, I'm a Virginia, like, like most of you or all of you. Um, I, in Loudoun County, I am, my background is a speech language pathologist, but the, my current job is as the assistive technology specialist. That said, I don't like to think of myself as an assistive technology specialist. I think of myself as an inclusive design facilitator, someone who helps other people design inclusive educational experiences. I do a podcast called Talking with Tech with my co-host, Rachel Madel, and uh, that's all about augmentative communication. And then I've had the great fortune of writing a couple books. Uh, the most recent that is out that people can actually hold in their hands is called The New Assistive Tech, Make Learning Awesome for All. And I'm Karen Janowski. I am a little bit north of all of you. I am in out of Massachusetts. I'm the president and owner of EdTech Solutions, and we are a full service assistive, assistive technology, AAC um, company in Reading. And we are all about inclusive um, applications so that to reach every learner and promote success and independence. We are passionate about helping every learner to succeed. And we are, the four of us are excited because we've got this new book coming out next month, Inclusive Learning 365. And we um, will be working from that particular book through this presentation. And I also have a blog and Mike and I also co-host a Twitter chat on Wednesday nights called AT Chat. And moving ourselves south on one night on uh, I-95, I am Mike Murata, and I am from New Jersey. We're getting close. We're getting back towards Virginia. Don't worry. We're getting there. Uh, we should have done this geographically as we went through up to down, back to, well, all right, next time. Uh, I am a, an assistive technology consultant. I uh, wear several hats in the field of AT. Uh, as a consultant, I have my own company that I go out and work with people. Um, to provide some support for assistive tech uh, capacity building as well as direct services to students. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor and also the director of the New Jersey Assistive Technology Act Project, uh, which is federally funded. Every state has one. If you don't know what yours is, go find it. Actually, while we're talking, I'm going to find yours and I'm going to drop it in the, in the chat so you guys have the link to it. Good stuff. Um, and I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Hey everybody, my name is Beth Poss and I am geographically across the river from you all in Virginia. I um, live in Maryland um, and I am currently the director of educational programs for Lesson Picks. Um, and I am also an independent inclusive technology consultant and a speech language pathologist. I am um, formerly 30 years with Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland. Um, and um, 
uh, where I was a, a speech language pathologist, a member of the assistive technology team, and also um, a former school administrator. And I am very proud to be one of the authors of um, our Inclusive Learning 365. Um, and you can connect with me on Twitter at PossBeth or on Instagram um, at um, Beth Poss, or you can always reach out to me via um, email at PossBeth at gmail.com. So what we're hoping that you'll gain from today's experience is um, really adopting, if number three, really adopting an inclusive mindset, thinking about what you're currently doing and are you reaching all of your learners with your current instructional methods. So having, once you're adopting that inclusive mindset, then it will probably impact the instructional methods and strategies and tools that you are using. And so we do hope that you will also learn a few, um, about a few free or low cost tools that will help support your implementation of that inclusive mindset. So speaking of that inclusive mindset, to adopt a mindset, it, it rarely happens all at once, like a giant comet coming down and smashing into the earth, there's giant change. No, it happens slowly over time. And th that is sort of the premise behind the book. And what we like to think about is, is learning every day. Um, and so let's ask you, right? Let's get the chat started. Let's get the conversation rolling. Um, go ahead and put it in the chat if you'd like. Uh, or if you want to pop off mic, uh, feel free to come on mic for a second and tell us what's one little thing you do to keep your own learning going. And when we mean learning, we mean like intentionally learning, not like, oh, I listened to the news today and I learned that there's a backup on I-95, like not that sort of like um, accidental learning, but intentional learning. And hey, from Ireland, welcome, Hi. welcome. I, it's so funny, I just finished tutoring um, a last hour, a little girl in uh, Northern Ireland. So I know it's not the same, but same neck of the woods. <laughs> so a lot of people are saying Twitter. Um, Twitter. Keeps you in the loop, but you struggle to get others on board. Yeah, same weather, Twitter fellow colleagues. Any other, so social media is one of the ways clearly. Yeah. I would also say, uh, um, yeah. I still read books. Yeah, we got a whole stack of them in front Absolutely. of you. Yeah, 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 we, got, we got loads, we're, we're, we're actually thrilled that you guys still read books since we're yeah. publishing them. Um, and you know, Karen, sometimes we, we read books with our eyes and sometimes we read books with our ears. I'm curious, does anyone listen to audiobooks or podcasts? Both. Put that in the chat. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> she gives, Amy. Amy gives too much of her money to Audible. The other thing too is hopefully you know about the Libby app so that you can get audiobooks from your local library. And that's free. So this is great. These lots of ways to stay current, to keep on top of things when it comes to your own learning. Excellent. Is anyone, do you notice the um, closed captioning that's happening at the top of the screen, the captioning? Is anyone using that particular technique when they are um, as an instructional method to reach all learners? Yes. Sorry, Karen, my mic's on, so I'll just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see Tim does, Catherine, excellent. Great. Thank you for participating. We really want this to be something, you know, that give and take. We learn from you, you learn and you learn from us. Yeah. And 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 to piggyback on the last slide, uh, I think we're gonna find very similar answers here, um, where it's not just about learning, but about building your professional network and how do you do that? Uh, and we've already seen some of those answers in the chat where people are, are heavy on Twitter and Instagram uh, to um, not only learn from others, but to build their networks and tap into other resources. Uh, and so we'll throw it out to the chat one more time. Um, are there 
other ways you uh, connect to to other professionals to build your network. Um, and if you do social media, you can throw that back in there also. I'm just curious on um, what people are doing um, to build their networks. Uh, Denise, back in the day, I hear you. I just said that exact phrase, Denise, to someone yesterday. Remember back in the day when I could just stand in front of you and chat with you? Um, we'll get there. We'll get there again. We're networking in person. How awesome yeah. is that? We'll get there again. Yeah, we definitely will. Yeah, for sure. Yes. Face to face. It will happen at some point. I was just telling my uh, co-authors before we jumped on the call today um, how I, I submitted uh, sessions to a conference that we all will submit to in the fall, and they're actually going to be live. And I think that might be the first moment where I leave my house. Um, and I don't know. I'll, I'll have to put like real like real pants on and not shorts every day. And, and I'll have to button my shirt all the way down, not just to where you guys can see it right here. I'll have to actually clean myself up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Tim, I mean, that's a really good point. You, the idea about the committees and the events that happen in your local area is so important, so powerful to, to not discount those local connections, um, but find those and build them and make them even stronger with some of these out of um, your local area contacts. Yeah, participating in those localistic um, state conferences and yeah, so many ways to stay connected. Yeah, awesome. Good stuff. Thank you guys. Thanks for participating in the chat. It helps. It helps to, to know people are there and that you guys are, are uh, with us. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier too, the big thing is let's reflect on what we are currently doing. Do our instructional methods work for every learner? Do they reach every learner? Are we acknowledging the learner variability in our classrooms? Do we have multilingual learners or, or learners who come from different cultural backgrounds? Do we have um, learners with vision impairments or physical um, impairments or dyslexia? So always reflect, are our current methods reaching every learner? And one of the things I always like to throw this slide up because does anyone know what TWADI stands for? Can anyone guess, especially based on the picture and what I was just talking about? That's the way we've always done it. Yes, <laughs> who was that? That was great. I don't know, it was a voice from beyond that I who loved was it. that? That was excellent. <laughs> yeah, that's the way we've always done it. Thank Amy, you, you know it. it. Thanks, Thanks Amy. Amy. <laughs> Yeah, let's get rid of that idea and that concept. It doesn't work. It never worked. It doesn't work any now even more so. Karen, can I jump in here and say, we were recently asked a question, how can you say it's not working? Like, look at the technology and we were able to put out a vaccine in, within a year and we have new bridges and Apple comes out with new products and Microsoft comes out with new products every, seems like every hour. Like, how can you say it's not working? Right, that those students, there's somebody, those, those, those inventors were students, you know, at one point. So they, they, you know, are making a difference, but. But we would make the argument that it's working, um, that it doesn't work for everybody. Right. That it's working, that, that, that and in fact, uh, traditional model of education, people, those progresses happen uh, despite the education, not because of the education. Absolutely, we have to acknowledge that, yeah. So it is time for a change, right? Um, I mean, boy, this last year threw us into um, change. If you didn't want change, you didn't have a choice. Um, <laughs> although we know not all problems were all problems were neither addressed nor solved by what happened um, over the last year, but it certainly did force us um, in many ways to change the way we're doing things. And what we would say is there's still room for a lot more change, um, change the way that we um, are, are going to go forward with, um, with this, with education. So next slide. 
What we want you guys to talk to us about now is what does inclusion mean to you? And we know this is a, um, a, a DEI, a diversity, equity, and inclusion group. Um, and so what you're thinking of as inclusion, um, we hope is really broad um, in terms of your background, your experience, and the reason that you are attending this webinar. So go ahead and put it in the chat, or if it's more comfortable for you, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Um, and um, say it out loud, whichever is um, going to work for you. Um, we just want to know, what does inclusion mean to you? It's not a trick question. <laughs> yeah, it's too early in the morning for gotcha questions. That's yes. just not what we're It's not a trick question. I, we don't have that kind of energy this early in the morning. <laughs> And maybe for some of you, that's why you've chosen to attend this particular mm -hmm. set work webinar is to really dive a little bit deeper into what inclusion actually is when we're using an inclusive mindset to reach all our learners. And, and I would say like when we're speaking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, I think we are starting to do the hard work around um, diversity and equity um, and inclusion, you know, how we make inclusion a part of that um, for, for all of our learners, but, you know, making sure that those who have been marginalized um, in a variety of ways, um, and it's not just one population that's been marginalized, right? It's, it's a number of populations um, and how we, how we bring them in. And so we've got some people making some really great comments, like Jessica, making sure that all learners can access the materials, yes, and that all teachers know how to use strategies that work. Oh, you are singing our song, you are speaking our language, use strategies to work with all learners, um, embracing and welcoming everyone's differences and finding ways to support their learning needs. And Tim, accepting everyone no matter what, meeting them where they are to support them. Yeah, that's really yeah. so important. Awesome. Um, you know, what we should acknowledge is what no one wrote, and that is number of minutes in a general education setting. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not, we're, and that, I think, is one of the points we wanted to bring out is that what you are all talking about, Jessica and Susan and Tim, is authentic inclusion. It's not just counting minutes in a room. It's a changing of that mindset that Karen was talking about. So with that, we want to talk about some inclusive terminology. Um, and it's real, I really love it because Jessica was like already using that inclus inclusive learning uh, terminology um, in a lot of ways already in her, in her um, what she posted on the chat. So we, the, the terminology that we have decided as a group to use, so the four of us, um, and that we really want to get out there are the ideas of educator as opposed to teacher. Educator is more inclusive, right? That there is more, uh, it, it encompasses more individuals. You might not be a certified teacher, but you still are an educator, right? Um, learner, as opposed to a student. A student kind of um, maps it out to this very narrow, like K to 12 um, kind of group. I see, Mike, you're messing with the volume. Am I not loud enough? Make no, sure you're I'm... fine. I'm, okay. I'm trying to get my microphone to, to pick okay, you guys cool. up. Sorry, that's right. me. I'll, that's I'll just okay. messing around with No, it's cool. Um, we want to talk about learning spaces as opposed to school. We all learned this year that um, learning goes way beyond the typical school building or classroom environment. And so we're talking about learning spaces and learning environments as opposed to it having to be a physical building, right? And learning groups rather than grade levels. Um, we know oftentimes, uh, you know, it, for a variety of reasons, you might have mixed um, age groups, might mixed learning groups, mixed grade levels. Um, and whether it's because you've got a high school course that um, taps into multiple grade levels and is available, or whether it's because you are in a special education setting where there are multiple um, grade levels combined, or 
whether you're in a Montessori setting where that's the philosophy around it, there's so many reasons that you can um, have learning groups and not have it be about the grade level that someone's in. Um, and using the word invite, you're going to see that we use that frequently today. We invite you to respond in the chat. We're not requiring it. You don't have to do it. So thinking about how changing our terminology makes our actions more inclusive and what is it communicating to the stakeholders, including those learners when we um, use this language and to families when we use this language? So when adopting an inclusive mindset, um, which is really what we want to talk about today, right? Like, like we know you're probably here because inclusion, diversity, equity, and inclusion is important to you, but it's that mindset around it. And so when you adopt an inclusive mindset, the rest can sort of take care of itself. It's the very first step that you have to, that you've got to get through. And the first step in adopting an inclusive mindset is that uh, not everyone's like you, right? Um, uh, and, and that our individual differences should be celebrated um, and maximized, right? Um, the, the, those individual differences are what makes the community that we are in um, rich and exciting and interesting um, and how we learn. And so now we'll give you a chance to embrace another piece of technology. We know deep down, you all have your phone within like six inches of your hand right now. We know you do. It doesn't matter where you're sitting. Um, now you get a chance to use that thing and it's okay. We're inviting you to participate via your phone. Um, we wanted to do a quick little poll and we're going to use a menti for that if you're not familiar with menti it's a web-based kind of polling platform that allows you to create presentations um, with interactive questions inside them uh, and so we've just embedded the question into our current slide right now but if you open up your browser on any device even the one you're sitting and watching us on uh, and you go to menti.com and then we'll ask you to input a code and that code is 8534 zero nine four two and then answer this question um rate your inclusive mindset where do you think you live on this scale of an inclusive mindset and then share with us where you think your district as a whole is on its inclusive mindset um is there no inclusive mindset are you working towards totally inclusive or somewhere in the middle there. Uh, so share that with us and I will give it another minute. I'm watching the responses on another um, screen and I will flip over to the responses in a second. I put the code if it's easier for someone to copy oh, you. if you're doing it on your um, on the device that you're on. Um, I put the code in the chat to, to type in. Thank you. Um, and I can put in menti.com too. <laughs> Karen, Karen, isn't it so exciting? You don't have the results up, do you? Like, I can't, I don't, I don't see the results. So it's got, I, I can't I'm see. really, I'm anxious to see. And I'm curious to see if there's a difference between the two scores too. Yeah. I'll never say until I flip over. I can see them now. You want to see them? I think, um, there, yeah. I think we're good. I think, I think we're pretty close. I don't see them moving anymore. So I'll give people just another 10 or 15 seconds to put in their yeah. comments and I'll flip over. Bated breath here. I, I know. can't it's wait to exciting. see this. Super exciting. Oh, oh it's moving. <laughs> That's just for me to tease you. All right, here we go. Let me flip over. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you are moved. teasing us. <laughs> there you go. There is your answer. It's probably not the easiest way to read it, but it gives you a general idea. I, I didn't want to go into presentation mode. So your inclusive mindset, we are rating ourselves. At a, at a collective uh, of 4.3. And, and if you notice the shaded line, that gives you a sense of where people voted. So some people were at five, some people were down towards three, and then you see where the majority voted. Uh, and then your district mindset is at a 3.3. .3. But what I'm noticing with that district mindset is yeah. that scores range from the it's lowest possible the to the highest possible. Yeah, I thought that one was really place. interesting. Yeah, and and the fact that we ended up kind of in the middle as the as the score um, tells me that it was evenly spaced across all of that, which is really interesting. I like that. 
That's so helpful. And again, we often rate, oursel rate ourselves higher than our districts. So how can we be the change in our districts? Right, exactly. The, uh, it, it, so full disclosure, we've done this presentation before and shared these the same activity before, and those results were exactly the same. Wherever we've presented, it's people rate themselves individually higher than the, the institution that they support. Because like Beth said, that you're probably already thinking in this direction. Mm -hmm. So that really becomes the question of what can we do to be champions for inclusion to help bring that score up for everybody else? Because, Mike, if you bring us back to the presentation, sure the, the need is real, right? I mean, <laughs> this is not fine. We have, to, we have to make the change and we have to make it as soon as possible because there's real lives on the line here. Yeah, yeah exactly. And those lies start with our learners. And so we often hear this phrase like, oh, we're, we're not teacher-centered, we're, we're student-centered or we're learner-centered. We put the learner first. And so in the same way we asked you, what does that mean? What did inclusion mean to you? What does a learner-first mentality mean to you? What does it mean to put the learner first? We're curious to see what you would, uh, what you would write or say. Again, we invite you to pop on here with the, the, the nice group that we have here. You could come on mic and say what you're thinking. Yeah, Leslie, what does that mean, a student-centered learning? Like, if you're describing that to, um, you know, a, a parent at a family gathering, well, I really work on student-centered learning, and they go, well, what's, what's student-centered learning? I, I was a student. Uh, what does that mean? How do you describe that in your elevator pitch, you know? I would say that what you want to do is I have the content base that I have to instruct in. And there are a myriad of ways to get to that content. And if I allow, like Suzanne said, differentiation, if I allow options for students to engage with that content, they can engage with it in different ways. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the hardest part of instructors from an instruction point of view, from where we have been to where we want to go is getting your mindset around that assessment piece of how to understand where they are and how to understand, is that enough for this particular piece of con content? So as a class, we can move forward or whether we need to move forward like an airplane lands in the wind. Yeah, excellent, great. excellent. It's great, Leslie, thank you. That's really good. <laughs> and are we including our learners in um, some of the choices that we're offering them? Do we, do we consider their perspectives and <laughs> you know, include them in those kinds of conversations. Yeah, and, okay. and Karen has a really great comment in the chat about adult learners and that subtle shift of, of valuing, considering and respecting the knowledge they already bring and the information they have and making learning worthwhile for them. It's what we're doing today, right? Valuing all of you. We are all professionals here. We all know great stuff. And we can all have an opportunity to teach each other something. So I think it's a great point. Thanks, Karen. And I would, I would add, one thing I would add would be just think about, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but have you ever, um, we know sometimes curriculum, like, you know, we're, we're hostage to, to the curriculum uh, that we are given to teach. So have you ever looked at a lesson um, in the written curriculum and just known the way that lesson's written is not going to work for your students in your classroom and said, hey, I can address these standards mm -hmm. that the curriculum lesson's supposed to be addressing. I can do it in a different way and just chuck that out the window. And I'll tell you, I was, uh, I was, I was in school administration for, for seven years and including being an assistant principal. And I would far rather have walked into a teacher's classroom, an educator's classroom, and seen them chuck that written curriculum out the window and do something different that was going to meet their learners' needs than have them deliver that scripted lesson um, and not see the students, the learners um, benefiting from it. So you don't have to answer if you've done that or not, but just kind of putting that out there. 
Well, can I jump in here, Beth, and say, well, let's ask this to the chat, uh, because I think it'll be a nice segue to the next slide, but don't go there yet, Mike. And that's this. About um, a year and a half ago, when we went to emergency distance learning, so March to June, the school started shutting down, you all remember, right? Do you know any students that did better that from that March to June, they did better. Look at Leslie nodding, right? Like I put it in the chat. Do you know students that did better? And so that that is a, a thought of, well, okay, what, what was it about that design that made it better? And I would maybe argue that it was a little bit that it was self-paced, that students could work in their own time, in their own place with the, with it sort of forced the teacher to be the guide on the side that we've um, been uh, um, proclamating about. And so with that in mind, there's actually a model of learning that, that follows that trajectory. Beth? Yeah. So next slide. Yeah, there you go. So, you know, what, if you've heard of flipped learning, and I'm not going to read the, um, I'm not going to read the definition there, which is from flipplearning.org. But a lot of us, when we think about flipped learning, we think about, oh, it's where you're recording information in advance and giving or, or providing other types of resources, multimedia, different types of resources for that learner to engage with prior to coming into the learning space um, and um, and engaging then in in supporting those learners um, being able to get that content right and what we want to say is let's put an end to flipped learning i know you guys are shocked <laughs> not because not because flipped learning is a bad thing we're saying giving um learners a, access to the materials that they need to be able to learn, having them there before, during, and after the learning is occurring is critical and important. We just don't want to call it flip learning and have it be this alternative way of delivering instruction. We want it to be the way that we just do it. So one of the benefits that learners had <clears throat> during virtual instruction was that there were recorded resources, right? You know, even if the teacher was delivering a lecture, a traditional lecture online, if that teacher at least recorded it and had it available for that learner to go back to as many times as they needed or to review the piece that they needed, right? That's good. That's all a good thing. And so what we want to say, let's just call it learning right now. It should be the way that we do it. And going back to that idea of the language that we use to communicate to stakeholders, flipped learning shouldn't be like, oh, it's the opposite of what we do already. It should be the way we're doing it now. I'll get off my soapbox. Thank you very much. That was my TED talk. I was waiting for you to hop down. All right. Perfect. <laughs> so you, uh, so now let's get into the technology a little bit. And how does the technology support the learning? Um, and one of the things that we like to focus on, you're going to see it as a focus on the remainder of the slides in our time together, is what are we what are we inviting the learner to do? So that that phrase there at the top, what does the learner need to do? We don't mean what did the instructor what did the instructor <laughs> tell the student to do, and therefore you need to do it. Instead, as Beth was getting at, when you have a, a learner centered approach, they're taking it on for themselves and they are in charge of the learning, what do they need to do? What are the tasks they need to do to uh, acquire knowledge, um, use it in different ways, critically think, all the, uh, all the stuff, right? And how does technology support that? So one of the, the, the tenets that we really um, uh, get behind is the idea that the tool comes second to the task and to the strategy that you're trying to teach. So the strategies are something that uh, is an approach to learning that the educator can help the, the, the learner adopt. You know, here are some strategies you might, know, might, might not know about. Oh, and here's the technology that might help you learn the strategy. So often in our work in the, in the technology realm, we get into this mindset of tools. We need to learn about new tools and we wanna throw new tools at kids. And it's fun to learn about new tools. Um, and so the rest of this session, we're sort of gonna put the tools on the back burner. You're gonna see them. There's plenty of hyperlinks to tools, but it's what are you going to do with those tools? This session won't be a tools dump where it's just tool after tool. It's more about the strategy that comes with them. 
And, and if you've ever gone to a session and, and while uh, Beth hopped off the soapbox, I'll jump on it for one second. Um, if you've ever gone to one of those sessions that's 60 tools in 40 minutes or 100 tools in 20 minutes, the number's never right, by the way. It's always off. It's always more tools than time. At the end of some of those sessions, there needs to be that one moment where someone says, now what? How are you supposed to use any of these things? Um, and, and so that's why it's so critical to put these things to the back. Look at them second. Because as we know, I did my own little segue. Uh, flip us to the next slide. Segue. Yes. Go ahead, Karen. Right. Yeah. As we know, tools come and go. And the, the strategies, the methods, they persist. And think about all the tools that you have used in the past that are no longer even possible to use. And the, <laughs> so here are some, uh, uh, some additional tools that are no longer available. Visti, put it in the chat. What is your favorite tool that has uh, gone the way of the Dota, right? Hop in your DeLorean. Let's go back to 1985 and tell us what was your favorite tool that you just can't use anymore. And while you're putting that in the chat, I'll mention some of these, like Dippity there, for instance. That was a timeliner tool. Timeliners have been around forever, having a timeline as a strategy Dippity is gone, but now we have Sutori as a, as a replacement or other timelining tools, right? Um, Kerpoof is a, was a comic animation app, you know? Well, now we have Storyboard That. And it's gone, Kerpoof. And it went kapoof. And, we're and, it resists. <laughs> <laughs> and also today's meet, you know, you think about this back channel tool um, that we're using that went away. And one of the things we've seen in this flip to virtual instruction in these kind of Zoom meetings um, is the power of that chat box and how powerful that's become as an, as an extension of the learning. And it's a shame that today's meet is gone, but we do have a tool like Yo Teach, which is a similar tool to that, um, that provides that same ability for people to participate in that back channel. Um, and I, I've said in some meetings, the back channel in the chat is 10 times better than the actual meeting itself. Um, and I, I wish I could almost just open the chat sometimes and not sit on camera uh, because that's a better learning experience, but I digress. Yeah. Uh, and so as Chris said, what we'll do is We'll dig in a little bit. We're gonna we're gonna dig into some of the strategies. We'll share a few in our last couple of minutes together um, as we go through them. Please feel free if we talk about a strategy that is something you use in your instruction. Share what you do. Are there tools you use? Are there ways that you engage your learners um, to support that strategy for learning? So we're excited to dig into some of these as we go towards the end of our time together. And. I think that's me also, right? Yes. Um, there's the areas. And so these are the areas we're going to break down that we talk about in our in our book. We have these eight areas of focus. Um, they're eight, seven, seven, seven. These seven areas of focus, like I said, uh, reading, writing, STEAM, research and studying, executive function, social, emotional learning, and professional learning. Well, awesome. We do have an eighth area. It is uh, a cross content, cross content in the book, but you. this is what we're covering today. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So I was right, yet I was wrong, all in one little nugget there. Pretty good. Uh, so as you um, think about the changing to an inclusive mindset or you know, just considering, here are some questions to consider. So think about what the learning task is that you're asking of your learners. Um, what, how can you accomplish that using an inclusive mindset? And the way we've designed the book as well, we are also giving you some extension opportunities and we're also um, offering some inclusive uses and also giving you some sample tools. So think, and as well as some uh, additional resources to really help you better understand that particular strategy and how it can be more inclusive. So we'll move to the next slide and think about what is, so the first one that we want to get into, okay, your task, what is the task? We want to gain meaning from assigned text. Very common task that um, our learners have to accomplish. And it can be across a variety of content areas. So how do we do that? And next slide. So 
what we want to think about is integrating those scaffolded supports because some of our learners clearly struggle with reading comprehension for a variety of reasons. And think about what those reasons are. Think about what you're currently doing when you are trying to enhance the understanding and the background knowledge of your learners. Think about the challenges. What interferes with a learner's ability to understand content? Maybe they don't have the background knowledge. Maybe they don't have the, um, the understanding of language. Maybe they're a multilingual learner and they don't have the, the understanding of complex language. Maybe they have word processing. I, I mean, memory, um, working memory issues and, so that they can't hold on to the content. So what they're understanding and reading at the beginning of the article is no longer in their memory by the end of the article. There's so many factors that can interfere with a learner's ability to understand their content. And so what we wanna do is help them gain those active reading strategies and think about how we can support those learners who are struggling in those areas. Maybe our paper text, and I, we will always say paper doesn't work for so many of our learners, but that paper text, we can't modify the visual presentation of it. And for some learners, just enhancing the size and increasing the white space makes it easier to read and then they can understand it better. So the sample tool for this particular strategy would be something that's called Actively Learn. And if any of you are using a tool like Actively Learn, I'd love to um, see it in the chat, let me know. The beauty of Actively Learn is it has so many different features that bypass the learning challenges for many of our learners. We wanna think about learner variability, we wanna think about universality. And so you can embed questions throughout an article so that a student doesn't have to hold on to that information until they get to the end. You can change the visual presentation. You can have the article read back to you. And again, those learners who are, are learning the language or are dyslexic or have reading issues, it bypasses those challenges. So there's a lot more to this particular strategy, but I wanna make sure that we have time to go through all of them. The next task, composing text. We all compose text, no matter our age, no matter what. So the task is composing text. Now, what do we do? The strategy for what do we do when our multilingual learners need to compose text? What are the challenges that they have? And again, when we wanna think about what the challenge is, very often the understanding of the language is they're still gaining those kinds of skills. So the ability to compose text in their original language, in the language that they're more comfortable and familiar with, can help bypass those challenges. So we want to reduce that cognitive load, help them to better demonstrate what they're learning and what they know. And so the sample tool, there are actually two of them at least, and you probably are familiar with other ones, but in Word 365, which is free for educators and learners, as well as Google Translate, you can compose using your um, speech recognition or through typing, and it will automatically translate. And so you can go back and forth and improve the quality of your written work and re by reducing the cognitive load. And so here's an example of Google Translate. And then there's also some, some related resources that can help you better understand how to use these particular tools. But it's all about what is the strategy bypassing those challenges so that all learners, despite their underlying skills, can be successful and independent. And I would say with those multilingual learners that that because we they may be they may have more strength and complexity of language, likely will have more strength and complexity of language in that dominant language, right? In their language one, in that L1. And to be able to um, put all of that complexity um, and, um, and strength of language in what Absolutely. they're composing. I'm just curious too, is anyone using those particular strategies or those and um, are those particular tools or is there something else that you are using? 
always curious to learn from others, always ready. So feel free to put it in the chat and we'll move along. So strategy 228 is one that has more than one task. There's lots of different integrated tasks into this particular strategy that we might be working with. And the idea here is that I know many of the people in this room are supporting maker spaces. Uh, and the question becomes, what are you making? And why are you making what you're making when you're making? So um, that was so Dr. Seuss of me. I don't know how that came out. Watch it in the <laughs> caption was great. What are you making when you're making? <laughs> but so when there's a, an authentic problem, now you're making this actually help somebody or solve, a, solve that problem. So a quick little story or example is that my daughter is in seventh grade here and their uh, career technology education teacher, the CTE teacher, invited them to, to make something to solve a problem. Well, right outside our back door here is that they've uh, to cut down all the trees and it used to have a huge wooded area, but they're going to be um, building a, a development back there, uh, as we do in Loudoun, don't we, Leslie? Um, <laughs> and so the teacher said, <laughs> so the teacher yeah, said, Leslie's face was great. I'm sorry. I can't resist. <laughs> so the teacher said, um, what, you know, what's a problem that you're having? And she said, my daughter was worried about like the animals back there and the birds. And so, okay, what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm going to build birdhouses. And so she went in over to Thingiverse and worked on measuring and, and, um, and constructing this birdhouse, which you can see there in the picture. And then uh, if you go to the next slide, she printed it, you know, she made it and she printed it. And now she has an actual, we haven't painted it yet. It hasn't gone out onto the tree yet because dad needs this one for, for presentations. Uh, we'll put the other one out on the, on the tree because we can print more than we wanted. But the inclusive use here is one, it starts with, it should, not everyone had to make a 3D printed model. They could make one out of paper. They could make one out of cardboard. They could solve the problem that means something for them. And they're working on STEM. One other authentic problem is what do you get your fellow authors when it's holiday time and you're supposed to get them some sort of present? You want to share your appreciation for working with them. And so here is this. Uh, I went on Thingiverse and made an inclusive learning 365 ornament, printed it out, sent it to the co-authors and said, wait, why can't we give this to everybody? So if you click on that link and you have access to a 3D printer, um, you can click on that link and you can get your own ornament that you can hang up for your office, give out to those teachers that you support and, and let them know to, to help move them in that, in that idea of an inclusive mindset. So um, one of the tasks that students are often given is to um, find resources for their research, right? And so strategy 263, building collaborative resource lists with digital curation tools. And so this is around the idea of using bookmarking tools um, or digital curation tools um, uh, in a collaborative environment. And the point of that working collaboratively is that when we create shared resources, it allows learners to see others' perspectives on a topic, um, consider previously unknown sources. So somebody might be really aware of like this uh, resource um, for finding information like News ELA and somebody else might be knowing, oh, I can go right into um, the Smithsonian um, a tween a tribute resource and find things. Um, and then dividing that workload when researching, okay? Um, and so that inclusive component in is, is that um, learners who are working on collaboration, right, could be uh, able to better um, uh, uh, work together um, with executive functioning skills and then opportunities to pull together some one student might have difficulty with that um, with that task of and only come up with a few resources this way our work is pooled next slide. I know we're running short on time. So a couple of the tools um, for uh, to be able to support this would be the tool Digo, uh, which is something that I've used for many years. I know Chris has as well. Um, Wakelet is a newer one that people are really into. Um, and then of course, Google Keep. Um, but what I want to invite you guys to do is if you go to this, the link that I have there, if you use that QR code, is we invite you to um, crowdsource 
um, any of the resources that you're thinking of, tools or strategies. Um, and so you can put them, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in for this crowdsource 365. Um, so anything that you guys want to put in and we'll build out a collaborative resource list. Next slide. As we roll towards the end of our time, here's a uh, strategy 282 to help someone not only take notes effectively, but tag them to find them and organize them. Um, there, there is more to note taking than just jotting something down. It's being able to go back and find it at some point and then use that for whatever it was um, the task at hand. Uh, and so with this one, we're looking at providing some digital supports for this note taking um, function um, to help with executive functions uh, as students and learners move through um, their tasks. And so thinking about using OneNote and Google Keep um, as platforms to allow them to label and organize and find um, materials and notes, which is um, it's a shame this came up with five minutes left because I could talk about this till like, I don't know, noon, probably conservatively. So I'll stop myself, but say that it is a great, a great um, feature of these powerful tools that allow us to meet these tasks. So we have literally one minute left before we're going to stop and take questions from you. And so we might all need, at least the four of us might need to breathe right now. So go ahead and um, flip to the next slide. And I'm going to ask everyone just to take a few seconds um, and use this tool, which is just a Giphy um, that I inserted in here to help you with your breathing for emotional relaxation. So we're all going to inhale and then exhale. And we'll let you read that slide all on your own, but inhale and exhale and we'll move on. And I think we need to move on to questions probably. And we'll move on point. to questions, but I'll, I'll say before that, since I'm controlling the slides, I can do that. Um, don't forget creative um, ways to learn from each other and engage in learning experience and consider things like participant-led experiences. Uh, on that slide um, is a link to a playlist on YouTube of every week we have an assistive technology town hall on Zoom where people get together and we just talk. No real plan. And I kind of pride myself on the fact we have no real plan. No real plan. We just chat about things that are happening and we brainstorm solutions for each other. And it, it, that has been one of the best professional learning experiences I've had this whole entire year. Um, it's a community building opportunity. Uh, and it's not just for assistive tech. It is for everything. Thank you, Beth. It's really about people working in education to support learners. Uh, and so hopefully you'll join us there. And with that, I will turn it over to questions. And I'll leave it here as we take some questions. So anything you'd like to ask or share, you can come on mic. Uh, you can put it in the chat, uh, whatever works for you. As you're doing that, think about these takeaways. Sorry, Chris, I stepped all over your slide. No, you got it. <laughs> okay, so th think about these takeaways after you leave. Um, these reflective opportunities. Uh, I, I'm a big believer of taking a minute to reflect. I feel like we move from one thing to another so rapidly that we don't often take a minute to reflect on what we just did. Um, I know myself personally, I have to be in a staff meeting in three minutes, so I'm not going to have time to reflect. I'll reflect because I don't think the staff meeting is going to be super engaging. Um, <laughs> uh, so I will reflect then. Um, but taking those times during the day, what did you take away from this? How can it change your practice to better meet the learners that you work with? And we would love for you to share one takeaway that you have from this session um, in the chat. We, we're always interested to see what is something that you gained from this type of um, presentation. So share any, any of yeah. your, um, any takeaway. Or any questions that you might have too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, great point, Denise, exactly. Yeah. Our learners' reflection. Yeah. When we yeah. allow our learners to reflect, we really are building their metacognitive skills, and that's such an important part of the learner-centered approach. Awesome. Any questions for us? 
You guys have been an amazing audience. We really appreciate your interactivity. Um, it, it makes all the difference in, um, in how a session goes, right? Mm -hmm. When we have folks that interact, I'm sure those of you that are in classrooms these days um, totally get that, especially mm -hmm. with some of the challenges that there's been with getting interactions in a virtual learning environment. Um, and so we, we hope we, we're sending you with some, we know we rushed through the, the tools part, that last part, but really the most important part of this session was the stuff um, at the beginning. Um, so we hope that we gave you an opportunity to think on that. Well, it does not look like we have any questions in the chat. I do appreciate you all coming in and spending time with the this Youth Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Um, we can't wait to have some more time with you all. Um, if you could also uh, maybe put the Zoom link for your town hall chat that you all have and uh, Visti can tweet that out for you all to get more people involved. Do that right now. Yeah, Mike, that'd be great. <clears throat> And it's really fun. It's really very, when he says that there's no agenda, there's generally no agenda. So it's just an opportunity to say, hey, I'm dealing with this. Um, or, um, or what do you think about this? Or I have a celebration. Um, and just folks that are interested in hearing and sharing. I will tweet that out today. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. I really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah, this was wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Amy, Karen, Visti in general, thank you so much. Um, so often we get to speak in special education circles. And so getting an opportunity to speak to a much wider audience, to because inclusion doesn't happen just in special ed. It has to be an everybody uh, initiative. And so we appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. It is everyone's responsibility and all of us have to take ownership to ensure that we are reaching every learner in our, in our district. Thank you all. Very yes. Good. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thanks Bye. guys. Thank you everyone. Thanks.